Okay, I think we can start now. I, um, Steve, you're unmuted there. So hi, everyone. Um, you just have to pardon me as I am letting people into the waiting room as we're talking here as well. Um, my name is Bill Belcher. I'm the Director of Development and External Relations for UCROSS. Thank you so much for attending tonight's Spotlight event. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Spotlight is a nationwide series of artist-centric events, um, virtual this year in 2020, but in person in previous years, um, that is designed to celebrate our, you know, UCROSS alumni, their work, and the impact they have on the nation's arts and letters. So we are really honored and thrilled to have Toshi Reagan here tonight and Christy Edmonds from CAP UCLA. Uh, the Center for the Art of Performance is a, is a partner of UCROSS and Steve will speak more to that. Um, but I want to welcome you both here as well as Mark uh, Schwed, who is the classical music critic at the Los Angeles Times, who will moderate this discussion. Um, and I'll let Steve take it away and do the proper introductions. Um, so everyone, I'm passing it over to Steve Jimenez, our vice president. Great, thank you, Bill. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, the UCROSS staff and trustees, a warm welcome to audience members around the country uh, and a very special welcome to our guest, the one and only Toshi Reagan. Toshi is an acclaimed uh, singer, songwriter, guitarist, composer, producer, curator, and much, much more. Uh, we'd also like to welcome the uh, visionary artistic director of UCLA Center for the Art of Performance, Christy Edmonds, and our moderator, Mark Swed, a music critic for the LA Times. We're here for a conversation, an inside look at Toshi's stunning adaptation of Octavia E. Butler's uh, Parable of the Sower. Um, UCROSS is extremely proud of our partnership with Christie and UCLA and that Toshi and her collaborators were able to use UCROSS on the high plains of Wyoming as a creative sanctuary while developing Parable. Uh, in deeply challenging times like these, the eloquent voices of Toshi Reagan and the late Octavia E. Butler are sparking the kinds of public conversations we so desperately need. So it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mark Swed. All right, there, Mark, I am asking to unmute you, so. My I hope you can hear me. My, I apologize in advance. My internet seems to be a bit dodgy today, but it looks like it's working now. And oh, Steve, for inviting me here. And it's a great pleasure to be with um, Christy Edmonds, who I've known for many years, and Toshi Reagan, who, who I've known for many years. As well her mother. Um, and if you don't know much about Parable of the Sower, the uh, novel, the visionary novel that um, Octavia wrote three, um, I appreciate really what this means now. Um, but to begin with, we have a video a little example of what it was that um, Toshi Reagan was able to produce in this opera that um, she has spent many, many years working on based on the novel. All right, thank you, Mark. I'm gonna share this first video here now. Here we are in Octavia E. Butler land. Daddy, today is our birthday. You are 55, I'm 15 years old. Dream, I had my dream again. No matter how we get there, so it is 
so special to actually do it here. And especially since I went to the Huntington, got to be around paper that she wrote on, letters that she typed to other people. It warmed my heart. This is, I would say, kind of a West Coast homecoming for me as an individual artist. I'm coming back to CAP UCLA for the second time, but I'm also extending a relationship that I have had with Christy Edmonds for a number of years. Toshi really carries on the way in which music moves people towards acceptance, engagement, taking agency, looking at the lives and conditions of others. When I first brought Toshi to Los Angeles with her band Big Lovely a number of years ago, she was beginning to work on this particular idea. She originally premiered it and then recognizes that she needed to rework it. How do you keep up with exponential change and things that are deepening in the American culture? Because really what you're trying to do is keep the artists on the path where their vision can be fully executed and to give this the heft that it really needed inside of Los Angeles. What is really interesting to me is what kind of path making we can make right now with all of our wealth of practices, wealth of knowledge, wealth of generosity, especially at UCLA, especially in Los Angeles. There's a whole network of people who work with her work because it's not a lead up to the show. It's a lead up of wherever, how far we can go. And it doesn't have an ending to it because we're not gonna gather people and then be like, oh, we sold tickets, we had a great show and we'll see you later. No, we are actually interested in uniting with people everywhere, especially the communities that we've already done the show in. It is about cultivating and expanding. It's an investment, not just in me, but it's an investment in the work. It's an investment in telling and supporting Octavia's story. And it's an investment in all of us. I'm really grateful for it. All right. All right. I'm going to unmute Christy and Toshi now. And um, Mark, let you take it away. Maybe his, his Wi-Fi is not, not working. Ooh. Yeah. He may have. Yep. Looks like he may have dropped off. So um, Toshi, Ooh. you want to offer some introduction? We <laughs> can have the chat between the two of you. Well, yeah, Christy and I can talk to each other. We, we're <laughs> really good at it. <laughs> uh, well, I'm Toshi Regan, and um, and I I want to uh, you know I guess I would tell a little bit about how we ended up um, at U Cross yeah. on our way to LA, and um, it's a very cool story because basically um, Christy met me. At, a, at a, a, a restaurant near the airport. I landed, <laughs> she met me. And, um, and then we just like, you know, had a couple of shots of tequila and talked about Parable and what we thought, what we thought it needed. And Parable from the beginning, it's never been done the same way twice anywhere. It's always had an evolution. Um, you know, it's, it's a big show but I really insisted that it, it debut in 2017. And at, it's it, for the show of this size in America, our workshops were in 2015 and it, it debuted two years later. And that's really not done. Um, nothing about this is that I did is, is, was correct at all in terms of American theater. Our show is too big. People are always asking how we can make it smaller and um, but it was impossible to make it smaller. In fact, I was like, can we have more people on the stage? So it, it really was an evolution. It debuted at NYU um, Abu Dhabi Art Center. Um, and there's a beautiful article in the Paris Review about Octavia in Abu Dhabi that I, you know, Google and see if you can get your hands on. It's pretty cool. And every place that it's been, it's, it's, the presenters, I call them the like bravest presenters, but the presenters have used it to have a very specific and particular conversation with their community. 
And it is a, a long road to, to the, the day the, the theater is open. And that road is really a road of, of collaboration and creation with people in the community to look at the issues that are in the novel and how they apply to the, the community and what does the community want us to do with this piece. And we have really surprised a lot of people. Um, it is very different kind of way of presenting work. And every presenter that, that decided they wanted it in their communities really had to make a huge commitment, not just financially, because like I said, it's a big show, but also to kind of open their own doors and say, all right, how do I want Parable to exist here? And I think Christy, um, the show is independently produced. I, I produce it with like a team of amazing people, but it doesn't have backing like some of the other shows you might see like Hamilton or something like that. It's not a commercial piece of theater. I like fundraise every time we go out and do a show. So one of the parts of our show that, that, that we suffer is our rehearsal time is like bananas. Like we get in like two, three weeks before we end up someplace and then we hustle a rehearsal. We are very creative. The actors and musicians are geniuses, but we never really get time to explore like, well, what if we wanted to try this? What if we wanted to do something like this? So Christy, because she's like, knows me very, very well. Um, and then also because of her genius at her job, with, really when we sat down at the restaurant, the first thing she said was, okay, what do you need to make this better? <laughs> like, she put down a bottle. So what do you need? Like, what do you want? Like, I know you, what do you want? And I was like, time, I need time. I need time to to like try some things and um, and so that that led to us um, being in residence at U Cross and I think Christy you could you could take yeah. it. You know the amazing thing with um, U Cross is in in our relationship with in in our collaboration together, I end up with the extraordinary privilege of being able to. <clears throat> take over one of the residency time periods up there in Wyoming to be able to nominate an artist in or an ensemble in so that they can have that time. But having time, <clears throat> sorry, having time that's unencumbered by daily life is a very different kind of having time than the time um, that we are constantly trying to expand in our daily lives. So when I talked to you, Cross, I said, look, this is, this is the project and this is the group of artists that I really believe will have not only they will enrich your lives by being there, but you will enrich theirs. Um, and this time that they're needing is a time to be able to kind of nuance and refine and rethink and put put the material back in the body rather than touring, touring, shut down, next, tour, next, long, elongated time, side hustles, side hustle. But really like how do we, how do they as an ensemble get to be together? in the material with both reflection and carrying an idea forward in ways that they just wanted to keep refining and, and discovering and finding. So I said, you cross was like, we're, we're up, we're in, let's do it. And there off you went. And then you had what hailstorms and tornadoes and all kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. We didn't, we didn't perfect get bonding detail. exercise at art camp. Yeah. It was amazing. And I think what I should say is like you cross, is um, it's it, you know it takes a long time to, to get there, and if you fly from Denver, you're on one of the like uh, just scariest plane rides I've ever had in my life, because of the the wind and everything. But like everybody who regularly flies a plane is completely used to it, and then the plane makes stops, but they don't announce them, so <laughs> you're in the air, yeah. And all of a sudden the plane's going down, and we're I was just like. What is going on? So you flying isn't your favorite activity, and on, it already and, isn't anyway. my favorite activity. Yeah. Like Juliet and I were like, we're we're gonna go back, but we're driving from Denver. <laughs> we're never yeah. taking this flight yeah. again. But I would say the thing about it, you're right, is is the amount of time that you get to have just being in the craft. It beautiful space. Um, they, they take really good care of you. We right. had sub substitute chefs. And, um, and they were amazing. Um, 
I think they were from Vermont. And um, we only had our biggest size was nine people, but it was almost like eight different diets yeah. that they had to deal with. And they, they really, they just, they just were extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but the thing that happened there was magical. Um, mm. We, everybody played different characters in the piece and we got to redesign um, teams and we brought one like um, Yasmin Lee, who's a really amazing, uh, she's a choreographer, but we brought her in for just like getting us to move and be reactive in, in certain kinds of instances in this story. And I should say in this story, it, it has two parts. And one part is that they're in a community. It's their known community. They're very comfortable. They're, you know, going through their things. And the next part is like everybody's lost a lot of people and they're out in the unknown. They're just outside all the time walking up. So Yasmin was just really good at helping people convey these different expressions in their bodies. And then we just re kind of did all of these different things and filmed it. And then when it was time for us to come, I sent all of the films to the, uh, our associate director, Signe Haraday and our director, Eric Ting. And every single thing we did at UCross ended up in the show. You know, like I every- think you know, that thing of us sitting at, you know, the, the place outside of near the airport and talking about, you know, what do you need that allows it to f- fall forward in the way that makes it better for you is the thing that I knew having, having experienced the work before. And, and also because of how you so ingeniously manifested the way in which continuous different change going on in society writ large would be able to have its readjustment, which changes an art form. So instead of Mm -hmm. locking it into place where everybody's leg goes here at the same time and this note at the same time, you will let a, let it have a pliancy. And that takes a very different kind of discipline to remain open to new um, molecular situations really um, going on in society at large to carry the work forward. And when I saw it and what you had done with the piece uh, at UCross that then informed the production at Royce Hall in Los Angeles, I mean, it was staggering. But you have to, to, you know, it takes a discipline and, and a time and rigor to go, is it this color blue that we're after in the lighting or is it this color blue in the lighting? Is it this direction with my body or is it this direction with my body? Mm-hmm. All of those kinds of things that add energy, mm-hmm. velocity, and a, and, a, and a constantly evolving constellation is what you're able to do. It was just extraordinary. Mm-hmm. You know, Koshi, when I was just watching the um, film that Mark was that they were screening before um it made me so emotional i i was like Mm. i'm going to start crying Um, (laughs) i mean definitely uh and it happens to me each time damn you get me every time you get me every time um i think it would be really great for the audience if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to octavia's work Mm. and and for the audience you know this is an artist meaning toshi who, who decided to dedicate well over um, you know, five plus years of her life and practice in order to find form as inspired by this material. And I wonder if you could talk about Octavia a little bit here and yeah. the currency of the continuing relevance of this woman's voice. Yeah, I mean, Octavia E. Butler um, passed away in 2006 And a big dream of hers was to get on the New York Times bestseller list. And Parable the Sower got on the New York Times bestseller list um, just this this month, I think. Yeah. And that we, let me tell you, people who work on her work, we all like, we were just like, yay, thank you, thank you. And um, I have a podcast called Octavia's Parables with um, Adrian Marie Brown. And we're, we're want all of her books on the bestsellers list. Mm-hmm. Like we're really like go and buy Octavia's books because all of her books really, they, you know, some of them have aliens in them and some of them, you know, out of space and some of them are like, but they're all about us. They are all about us. And her way of kind of like setting a, a you know, multiple universes, which I think are kind of under 
one universe, um, but, but really being expansive on the way that we are mm -hmm. and the way that we exist, um, mm -hmm. particularly like on the planet earth and particularly our relationship to nature yeah. and our relationship to the whole like expansive existence of humanness. Mm -hmm. And so you will take a book like Kindred where, you know, it's in the seventies and there's a black woman married to a white man and then all of a sudden she disappears and ends up, you know, basically in the time of slavery to rescue one of her ancestors, who's a young white boy, you know? And I, that was the first book of hers I read. And I was just like, okay, this is like the worst story in the world. <laughs> like what if this happened, what really happened? But it's an extraordinary story. It's an extraordinary story. And it really makes you contemplate your own existence and what, what are you doing with your time? Um, and I, I met Octavia a few times and she was not like a real chit chatty person. She just really was, was very straight ahead, but going to the um, Huntington library really was, um, was, was so special because I really got to see um, a lot of the parable papers a lot yeah. of the ways that she was thinking about the book. She was like the biggest cheerleader for herself. Like she wrote huge notes like this, 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 we're yeah. gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Like she was very specific about the journey of her work yeah. and her research. Like if you're ever working on something and you feel like it's okay to skip a step or it's okay to, you know, she skipped no steps. Like mm. she, Everything she talked about in that book, the trees, the road, everything, she had actually researched or gone and visited herself. She just, you know, it's a made up story, but it's all true. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was the other thing. Uh, and, and Steve, I know you want to jump in here real quick, but the other thing with it too, I mean, there were several things around the necessity to bring this to Los Angeles in part to honor Octavia, who is from Pasadena. The Huntington um, uh, Library and Gardens uh, and the museum up there, they have her archive. So being able to just in the sojourn of Toshi to make sure that I could connect, you know, what Octavia made by hand to what Toshi was dreaming with her craft. And just even that alone was like driving me, obviously. Yeah. Well, so I have to say, I'm like super um, grateful for that because, you know, the whole point of, of doing parable for me is I call it like a parable path. And it is exactly kind of, as you say, Christy, like, you know, Christy could have just booked the show, like, and just had it be an event. She would never do that. She doesn't do that with anything. But, <laughs> but the fact is, is that like, you know, you weave a big path for us. So the you cross, the Huntington, there's beautiful doc documentation of me doing everything I did there because mm -hmm. we were really thought it was important. And so um, Cap did that. And there's all kinds of content that, you know, you can see around our, our being in residence at, at, like, I feel like we were in residence at Cap. Yeah. You know, we didn't just do a show. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful, like, um, we did a concert for like a thousand kids, like a short. Yes version of the show and that was like unbelievable like you know just just everything happened in and octavia's family um still lives in the area yeah. so they pulled in i think they have 40 or 50 tickets of octavia's family yeah. who came including the elder of the family who mm -hmm. made the trip so it was just very very special yeah and it go ahead no, steve no i was just gonna say christy that uh, when you mentioned earlier seeing the video that you got kind of choked up, I was really fortunate to be at the performance at Royce Hall, and I was really totally, totally blown away by it. And I wondered if you would, the two of you would talk a little bit about the preparation and the development specifically for what you did at UCLA, because it was really, I mean, you could feel the electricity in the audience. It was so powerful. Yeah. Well, you know, in the in the thing that Toshi's referring to, um, in more complimentary terms than the one I'm about to use about myself, 
I tend to like to um, overcomplicate absolutely everything in order to make sure we don't leave any energy left on the table that could be used in service to a community, including the artist. And so, you know, Toshi really off, off of her own bat was she was coming back and forth to Los Angeles. We were working on threading the community, connecting her with the Huntington, doing different kinds of things like this. We had round tables with students and various things because the thing also for, for Toshi to be able to do a sort of um, integrity of the expressive truth of Octavia Butler mm. would mean that she too had to put the tools of that book, the tools of useful humanity mm. in service beyond music. So it was literally, we, we kind of had this unspoken pact of being able to say, for everyone who doesn't see this show that we can still touch, it's, it's not about just being there in the audience. It's about building a community in which the access to both common and uncommon humanity falls forward together if we just put our bodies wherever they are most necessary and utilize every network we can to be able to say, I wanna hear from you. Um, it's, it's not about entertaining, it's about asking a culture to fall forward towards stretching beyond its fence line of familiar in mm -hmm. order to create a neighborliness so that we can utilize each other's cooperative sense of capacity. It's, mm -hmm. it's what the arts do, it's what UCROSS does. I mean, to be honest, this, this work is her weaving together many, many, many people across time and space um, and us all saying, and we can weave from our unique consequence or circumstance, the conditions of who we have access to so that we're able to kind of build that circle that goes spreading off into the, the winds of what is most necessary now. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of words. No, that's that is just right on the money. But Toshi, you know, the thing that was so unbelievably powerful about that performance was it was really at the beginning of COVID and it was before everything exploded in the country and it was there on the stage before our eyes. Talk about that. You know, you you yourself even commented at the beginning of the show and just said, you know, can you believe this that we are here <laughs> right now? <laughs> Absolutely. Just before you do, Toshi, you know, literally, so the audiences that are listening to this now can understand the context. We saw the kind of tsunami coming, mm. but we had yet to have a protocol. So all of us were inventing our own sense of health. Mm. The elbow bumps were in, but the shutdown regulations were not. And getting on a plane at that point was also a topic of conversation. These guys these extraordinary women and men who made this work with Toshi were like, we're on the plane, we're coming. They've landed, they're here. We have several days now to kind of situate it in time. And I was literally watching the county health advisors um, kind of newsfeed daily to make sure that we could proceed. Hmm. And it was a freaking miracle. Mm. So, Toshi, carry on. Yeah. Well, I think, it, you know, after I say this, if Mark's Wi Fi is, is going, then maybe you can jump in because mm -hmm. if yeah. that weekend was. Oh, good. Hey, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I changed. <laughs> yeah, because that weekend was, was, it was bananas. Yeah. You know, because the inform also, it was like the information was, was starting to happen. So it was like really at the beginning where I remember I went to Whole Foods to buy wellness formula just because that's what I do. Yeah. And the Whole Foods was crazy. It was in New York and the Whole Foods was crazy. And I was like, what's wrong with these people? And I went and bought like four bottles of wellness because I hate like take, you know, whatever, long story. But I bought four of them. I wasn't even hoarding. This is what I do all the time. I buy four wellness and then when it goes out, I go get some more. And I'm just chill, like, you know, what's up? And then Helga Davis, who um, is who is an extraordinary, you know, artist herself and is imparable. She's like texting me. She's like, yo, what's up with Whole Foods? And she's in Harlem. And I was like, I don't know. You know, it's Sunday. People love to shop on Sundays. I don't know. So when I got on a plane, I, I had, you know, understood like the washing the hands thing started to go around. Yeah. But and I always wipe my seat anyway on yeah. a plane, you know, like 
So I, I kind of was like that. And then when I got to the hotel, I was like, let me buy a humidifier because the hotel's very dry and let me get some wipes and let me do this and let me do this. So I'll just keep cleaning. So I did, the, I did it through Instacart and I will never forget this as long as I live. The, the woman that was shopping for me was like, she was like, sis, this is the only thing left in this store. And she took a picture and she's That's like, right. I got your humidifier. I got this and this. And she's like, there is nothing else in this store. And she sent a picture and I was like, girl, get out of there. Like, you know, so it, it was, it was so deep. And I did like everything that we now know you should not do. Like we were washing our hands. Um, the, the food switched from being like buffet style to being like individual. Yeah. Um, we were, we were but our group is a, a super huggy group. Like our group hugs, like they're not going to see each other forever. So everybody was still sitting on each other and hugging and everything. Um, <laughs> and mm -hmm. then the hotel had no protocol at all. Like I yelled at a lady in the bathroom for not washing her hands. Like it was, it was like regular hotel, regular mm -hmm. talking, everything. Um, at the show itself, like we definitely, you, didn't know, you know, people, I will tell you, I got hugged by 200 people that night, easily. Yeah. It was, and you guys, it was truly like at the beginning, pre-show, which Tochi was not out in front with the audience at the bar and the lounge and various things, because they're getting ready, hugging in the back in the green room. <laughs> but I could watch the audience and I knew so many people in that audience. And it was definitely this, this, and you know, this, and this. But by the end and after that show, mm. forget about it. There was forget no it. restraint on a single hug on the depth of people's profound mm. love. And everyone in that room knew this was probably the last time they were gonna be standing on a stage or mm. sitting in an audience together, but they just had the show of their lives. They had the show of their lives. They had the, the moment. I. I was sitting backstage and people were sending me pictures yeah. of the audience because the audience was gorgeous. It was like a, a true reflection of that community. Yeah. It was like all ages of people, yes. you know, children were at the show, like everything. It was yeah. just the revolutionaries. It was, it was everything. And yeah. people were like, I can't believe I'm in this room. Look at all these people. Um, it was extraordinary. And, you know, at the end, it was, I was just like, I don't know what it is. Three of the people who hugged me the longest actually got COVID. <laughs> yeah. and I have no, you know, I'm knocking on everything because, you know, and they weren't sure if they got it there and they don't sure if they got it afterwards. You know, one person in the cast got it yeah. um, about three weeks after we had left. You know, it was, it was, you know, I, I was calling everybody, was everybody okay? Because yeah. we really didn't understand like that just being together hmm. could make it happen. Like with the clarity around, there was still like misinformation around mask wearing. Yeah. That the, the mask is only for people if you're sick and not if you're not sick. That was still yeah. happening. So it was a deep transition, but two, but what by that Monday morning, <laughs> yeah. Everything was like oh. boom, boom. Hershey, can I break in for a second? because there is another video to show of the world gone crazy. So this is a perfect segue. Oh, yeah. All right. And then I want to ask Tosh, I want to ask you about the music. Sure. Well, I'll take the cue and I'll sh start the video right now.
Tears again. Tears. Oh boy. <laughs> Holy. Okay. You know, Take it away. Um, Octavia liked to say that she wrote science fiction as if it were in your neighborhood. And um, I actually understood that pretty well because I'm from Pasadena and was in the same neighborhood as she was when she was there. And though I didn't know her, I used to see her in the library all the time. And mm. I'll never forget her voice, which was the deepest voice I had ever heard in a woman. And it was that deep voice of a Marian Anderson, that is really low contralto, the voice you'd hear in the Earth Mothers of Erda in Wagner's Ring, of Cassandra. And what I found so interesting in the opera of the parable is it begins the way it begins, Toshi, your voice is very much the voice of Octavia as you are introducing the characters and the story. But as it goes along and as the world becomes more dystopic and we lose people, it, it becomes more of a conversation really between you and Octavia. And by the end, it's a conversation, it's become much more intimate between you and the audience. And, you, and by the end, you've moved the neighborhood to our neighborhood. You've taken her neighborhood and you've moved it to us. And in doing so, your tessitura would often change. Your tessitura, when it was her speaking, was very low. And then it would be more your voice that would come in when it was you. And then it was a different voice when you were addressing us. Than when you were addressing her. And I don't know how conscious you were of doing that, but it had an extraordinary effect. Mm -hmm. And by the end, of course, everybody was hugging everyone in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a beautiful, what a what a what a beautiful thing to notice. I mean, you know, I I think, you know, I take Octavia with me, you know, obviously anytime we do this piece, I'm thinking about her. I'm thinking about the story and I'm thinking about um, how present the story is as we've been working on it. You know, my mom and I really realized we could sing this, this story like in 1998, you know? So it's like, it's been a long journey um, to LA, <laughs> to Octavia's home. Uh, but what I, what I always think about, and, and I should say and be really honest, I never thought I would be in this show. I never was supposed to be in this show. I'm supposed to be with the, you know, with the orchestra, with, the, with our little group of musicians. I was not, I, I still kind of, 
I have grown into that, that part. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's like not my natural state of being. Like I don't consider myself an actor or anything. And the, the, the day we were doing the workshops and I was kind of, and the workshops were just us singing in a circle. And we didn't have, we only kind of like two, three characters, but not really the narrative. We just were like, what are these songs telling us? And I remember sitting with Eric and I was like, we just need somebody to kind of, just like every once in a while, let people know where we are, you know? And I was like, should we do it with video? Like maybe we could do it with video. And then I was thinking about other actors I knew. And I was like, maybe we could get like this person to kind of walk out and do this. And Eric was just looking at me for the longest time. Like I was dumb. And he's like, why can't you just do it? Like you'll be there. And I did it. And once I did that, like, you know, I'm in a meeting at the public and Oscar's there and Shanta Thake is there and Mayan's there and Eric is there and they're all looking at me and they're like, you have to be in it. Um, and that was scary because I just didn't want to. So I think the journey of like my voice in the show is a part of my evolution of, of finding my place in it. Um, because at the first like couple of times, the, the first year we did it, I was still kind of like, what the heck am I doing up here? Um, and I, I really like, so at the beginning, I used to come out on stage and talk for a long time, like a, a much longer time. And when we were in L, when we got to LA, um, I was like, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to come in and I want to start singing. And so Eric was like, yeah. And I had much more confidence in our storytelling because we had been to U-Cross and we had done this thing. And the audience hit me so hard in LA that I started like, yeah, <laughs> like I just, you know, went nuts. Um, but basically I think you're right about the journey. The beginning, the, the original idea for me was, was I would get us to up to the second act, you know, and then Lauren would get us like the rest of the way home. And right after the first two performances, we got all of this feedback that two things happen on the stage. One is in the second act, in the first act, everything is open. We're all under sim similar light unless there's a creative reason to change it. The second act, there's a huge blackout and then the stage is dark and then it's more theatrical. And people complained. Um, that song you just saw, World Gone Crazy is not an original song from the show. It's the song I had to write so I would sing in the second act and people wouldn't be sad. And literally we got all this feedback, like, but what happened to Toshi? Like, why isn't yeah. she talking to us? We can see her, why isn't she communicating? Yeah. And, and they were like, you have to write another song. And I was like, uh, yeah. so it is that thing. It is a, it is a transition. You know, I don't mm -hmm. think I, I understand it the way you said it, although I love the way you said it, really but nice. there is, I one thing happens, I feel like I'm opening a door at the beginning. Yeah. I think I'm, you know, I think that me and the talents, the two women with me are, are watching and participating simultaneously. And then there's a certain point where I just talk to the audience and say, can you believe this is happening? And I insert myself, you know, and then I go back and the story from there evolves very fast into catastrophe. Yeah. And so another voice arises. So I, I feel like I feel like you're right about that journey. I, I love I love hearing that. That's really yeah. that's really amazing. Yeah. And and it's a unique way of, of explaining it. Yeah. Mark, you're probably gonna ask this or talk about it, but and I'd love to hear. I mean, for those of you too who don't know Mark Swed. This is somebody whose encyclopedic knowledge of music and artistic practice and creative journeys across time and all of the different kind of heritage linking that goes on inside of um, the performing arts world is just staggering. But one of the things I think is imp important in the choices you were making, Toshi and Mark, please embellish, is the word opera. Mark? Um, opera means works. You know, it's, um, it's just a way of, it can be anything. 
So, um, you know, it's, it is its own. And I mean, whether or not this is an opera, I think is a meaningless question in some ways. It, of course it's an opera. Um, and, um, you know, Robert Wilson calls everything he does an opera. And in fact, I remember very well that he did um, an opera with your mother. And two. Was in it. With the, two with both of us. Uh, yeah. and you were, that's right. And which was just an extraordinary event in the way that music functioned in it um, and theater. And yeah, I mean, this is an opera in the way that it takes moments and gives them certain highlights and different meaning and different interpretation. And it would be really fascinating to see what you did with the, the follow-up novel of this um, Parable of the Talents, um, which the Parable of the Sower is supposed to take place in 2024. And it's what happens to the world after the terrible environmental crisis that we've had because of climate change. And by 2034, when, this, when the next volume comes along, there is whose motto is make America great again. Mm -hmm. And um, and again, it's, it's following through with inequality, with um, racial injustice, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, that Octavia Butler was so prescient about yeah. um, her understanding of where things could go. And I think the use of music, it, is something that takes it away from that specific conversation and just makes it central to everything else. Hmm. And, um, you know, I think your songs in, and I only saw Parable of the Sower once, so it's not enough to really get a sense of how things work. Um, I'd love to be able to see it a few more times. Um, <laughs> okay, let's all start. And I hope we will. But, you know, they were always about, about Butler, but not about Butler too, about the world we live in now. And, um, and I think that's what, what really matters. Mm. I appreciate that so much. I mean, there's a, I, I don't know what the protection over the word opera is, but I can tell you, I almost always have to fight for yeah. people to use it. Um, they do, they want to call it so many things. They're like, it's a, and then they're like, it's a folk opera. It's a, this, and I'm like, just, just stop. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> just stop. <laughs> it, yeah, just stop. Like, just, 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 just stop, you know? Um, and uh, you're right. We did uh, Temptation of St. Anthony with Robert Wilson. And that that opera got me to be a conductor at the Paris Opera House, which is one of the most extraordinary and special things any human can be. Um, mm -hmm. And there, then we did um, Zinnia's The Life of Clementine Hunter yeah. um, with Robert Wilson as well. So, you know, that, that journey and Parable almost had an, an attempt to open um, the late, great Gerard Mortier's first year at New York City Opera. Um, mm. But the, the financial things crashed and <laughs> Stephen got, got like, I don't know if it got canceled, but he, he left. That's yeah. a long story, but he is an extraordinary man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just, you know, yeah, at the end of the day, my mom, my mom is like, she doesn't like to write a dialogue that's talking dialogue. Like, and she wants any, any, any speaking to almost be talk sung or, and be pitched. She can't, you know, and I never developed the talent. So I write for a lot of other people who know how to do that. And I've, I've written songs for several plays um, and I've done musicals. And I think that's, that's really great work. But uh, any work that, now my mom's retired, so I can't get her back to do anything with me, but any, any, any work, <laughs> any work that you see me will probably be singing all the time yeah. all the time everything mm. oh. all the time and I and I think it's interesting because I the, you, there's two points you brought up Mark that are really great one 
you know, Octavia didn't really have a lot of music in this story. And so one of the reasons why I inserted myself was because I'm kind of like, where is the folk singer in this story? Like, where's the person like who wrote that long song complaining? And the other thing is we actually have the rights to Parable of the Talents because I actually use some elements of Parable of the Talents in the show. So we created these characters, um, the, the talents, and then we also really use the idea for that in the in Parable of the Talents that takes place, you know, in the 30s. Um, part of what Lauren Alamina was doing was, was writing down histories from the different people who had traveled and she asked her husband, um, Ben Cole, to, to write about like what happened. Like, why did, why did things get so bad? Like, why did they get horrific? And why did we let this happen? And, and that's basically what he says. He says, sometime around 2014 or 15, we just let it happen. We let it slip away. Mm -hmm. And the we is us. It's not like some, it's not anybody in government. It's like us. Mm -hmm. And actually my whole reason for, for being like, we have to go out at 2017 is literally because of that. It is because I was like, we have to be activating so that we have created some pathways um, by the 2020s, we need parable pathways. We need to be connected in multiple ways. It needs to be multiple people who are very clear, like who, who are not still thinking that they have a choice in an election when there is no choice, who are still thinking they have to love a candidate when there's no candidate that you love. And maybe there was no candidate, if you're black, you ever loved in your entire life until Barack Obama. Like, and you still have to make specific choices. We, people who really understand how to work with the land, people who have a strong practice of, of um, nonviolence and creativity as a way for solutioning disagreements, people who are building um, in their community uh, ways to protect and take care of yourselves that don't involve calling a police every time something happens. Like all of these people, people who are artists, people who are writing books like um, Alexis Pauline Gums and Adrian Marie Brown and um, all of these other are dynamic artists who are, are doing work around these principles, but not just Octavia's principles, but the principles of their spirit and their souls mm -hmm. where they have just decided to get down to the task of living on the planet earth. Like you live on earth there is no place else for you to go. This is your world. And that's the conversation I wanted to have over and over again. Um, and I feel like this is the work to have it. And Parable of the Talents really shows you, you know, I don't wanna ruin the story for anybody, but it really shows you like, you have all these opportunities to put brakes on something that is trying to grow and overwhelm you. You have, you have multiple opportunities and it is your independent genius to accept what is happening, know what you see with your own eyes and do something about it, which can change everything. And this story is about change. This story is about change. It's about how you're not really in charge of anything that change can happen all the time. So what is your practice around change? And what is your practice around believing what you know? Mm -hmm. And when you think about where some of us are now, and you think about what that community and that story has done for so long, which has walled themselves in and successfully like had life in their cul-de-sac until this is like not sustainable. And when it's not sustainable, it's a child. It's a 15 year old girl that's like, this is not gonna work. We have to leave. And we don't even know where we're going. So I kind of feel like in today's world, there is a lot of people going, this is not gonna work. We have to do something. And I think this is the time where we stop like debating it and stop like, we just get down to like, we live on planet earth. How are we going to sustain our relationship with the planet and live together? Period. That's it. Let's just make this very simple. Let's stop playing like we have 
all of this stuff, all this room, we are out of, out of room. We don't have no room. And parable gives an opportunity every time it's in residence somewhere for a huge amount of people to have this conversation in the ways that they can. So as Christy said, we were at the Huntington, you know, we were at the underground museum, you know, the opening night was unbelievable. It was all of these people before the show even started giving all of this testimony, all of this brilliant work. And then if COVID hadn't happened, I was coming back Ooh. because yeah, because it, it doesn't stop for me. I go back to every community that Parable has been in. That's right. And then we continue working and then we bring people with us yeah. to the different ones. So we are very serious about walking a path with all of the abundance and wealth that we have at, with us. Everybody's individual gifts, like it doesn't have to be the same gifts. Like you learn from this book, like who you are is kind of enough. And we are very, very dedicated to making transformative change through the lens of this book, but through the lens of the communities that gather around the, the principles and also the situations and issues that are in this book. Well, I think that's a great place to end because we sort of have to end at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a... Yeah, that's you know, that's Just like you ended Parable of the Sower so amazingly, you've ended this so amazingly, Toshi. Uh, well, I got a shout out. Oh. I got a shout out LA. I got a shout out Durham, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I got a shout out Boston, Parable Path. I mean, I, it's St. Paul, Saint Abu, Paul Dhabi. Abu Dhabi, Wyoming, you know, Wyoming. <laughs> we got to we gotta say Amsterdam and Singapore. Mm -hmm. And in 2021, we um, fall of 2021, if we're available and allowed, I got to shout out DC, um, Boston, and um, Cranert. Uh, those are three places, maybe more. We'll be packing them in. So keep an eye on yeah. us, Parable, parableopera.com. And hopefully 2021 fall, yeah. if not 2022 spring, and then we'll just keep scooting until That's we can. Right. But you know, there's also, you know, the beat goes on as it does. And there's also the Tune In Festival, which will go mm -hmm. worldwide. Um, Toshi's part of that. And so is Big Lovely, her band, who made up part of the cast of Parable um, with material that's really about music and poetry in a time of change. And so, you know, check us out so that you can Absolutely. have Absolutely. Cap UCLA Tune In Festival. It starts on the 28th. 28th. I'm on on the 28th. I'm on on the 31st. But yeah. but watch the whole thing because it's extraordinary. It's it, completely it is. extraordinary. It is. And it's, um, you know, it's a testament to you, Toshi and, and Mark and Steve and everybody in this room. We care about how we can dream a culture forward together. We care about what it means to take responsibility for cooperation and we need each other's eyes. That's the most political thing we can do is direct mm. our eyes towards what most needs to be seen. Mm. So let's get in there. Thank you all so much. Thank you. You cross foundation. Oh my God. You're <laughs> like magic in the world and a gift to the whole entire world. Thank you. Well, I'm coming back. <laughs> yes, come back. Thank you both, um, and thank you, Mark, as well, for this, I think, really terrific discussion. I think it, um, we could go on for, for another hour, because it just, I think everyone on this Zoom really um, enjoyed the thoughtfulness, and we all want to see parable. Yeah. <laughs> we all want to see it. Um, yes. You know, I also, you know, I want to thank our um, sponsors of Ucross Spotlight while I'm here. Um, so Adeb and Ed Kaler, Steve Jimenez and Miles Ferris, Carolyn Eason and Jim Rubin, they make this series happen. And I hope everyone on this call will consider uh, following along you cross and watching future spotlights. And of course, following along CAP UCLA and, and all the exciting things that are happening there now and in the future. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Steve for a final goodbye. Yeah, so am I on, Mark? Am I on? Yeah. Good, thank you, thank you. So. Uh, I just wanted to encourage again for uh, everyone to uh, really 
tune in to the Tune In Festival. It sounds like it's going to be really an amazing experience. And uh, we all really need that now. We all really need that festival. So I just, Mark, thank you again for moderating. And Christy, thank you for your generosity. And Toshi, we love you. Mm. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I appreciate it so much. Love, 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 Peace love. Peace and love. Everybody take care of each other. Take care of each other. <laughs> All right. Take Good care. Night. Good night.